Uh, so this is, this is a little surreal to me. Um, when I fell in love with Jesus, I told myself, I'm going to go to Bible college, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to preach at Severn, and it's going to be awesome. And, well, here I am. <laughs> it's so awesome. It, it really is. So, I don't know about you guys. You know, I want to I want to start off by telling you guys a little bit about myself. But I don't like cardio. Have any of you guys ever said to yourself, "Hey, I'm going to go for a run," and like halfway through your run, you're like, "I immediately hate my life." That that's me every time that I think about cardio. Anytime that cardio is involved with anything, like like Rick said, that I, I did four camps this summer. It it was awesome, re- very draining. I was exhausted and. During the, every camp week, there was always capture the flag, and there was always running involved with capture the flag, and it was like, why? Why? You know, or maybe, maybe you just like to jog. You, know, you, you like to run, and, and you're running. You know what the hardest part about running is? Putting on the shoes. Putting on the shoes is some of the hardest things. Like, I, I got to hype myself up just to put the shoes on. I got to tell myself, all right, Kyle, we're about to crank this out. And right when I finally get the last shoe on, I think to myself, hey, uh, I'm feeling a little enthusiastic about this. This might be pretty good. This, this might be just what I need to clear my head. But then I remember I have to stretch. Stretching's pretty important. Like you, if you don't stretch, you could tear something. You could pull something. I don't know. Ask Colin what, what could happen if you don't stretch. A lot of bad things could happen if you don't stretch your muscles. And that, that, that whole stretching aspect had me thinking. Why is it that we can talk all day and not have to stretch our tongues? Why is it that we could literally go hours and hours and talk and there's no strain? You don't have to ice your tongue down. You don't have to put any icy hot there. You don't have to do anything. You could just go on and on and on. You could tear someone down and not feel any inflammation. You could build someone up and not feel anything about it. There's no strain on the tongue when you speak. So that kind of thought had me at a loss for words. You know, it, it, I'm, thank you. I, I have it highlighted here. But, you know, it's weird to think about how you could just use that muscle all day long and you don't have to stretch it. You don't have to ice it. Today, like, like Rick said, we're going to be in the book of James, chapter 3 specifically. And in chapter 3, we're going to get some insight on the power of the tongue, or rather, the tongue in general. And the, the book of James is awesome. If you've never gone through James, I, I definitely encourage it. My professors over at, uh, at the Bible college I'm at in Missouri, they call James the Proverbs of the New Testament, just because it's just so rich with wisdom. Uh, so we're going to pick up here in verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a, by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life, and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father with it, and we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth, both blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. In the first couple verses, we, we, see, we see a theme of positivity in the first couple verses. You know, the tongue is a powerful influence for good, contrary to its minuscule size. Verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. What James is saying is if you have control over your speech, then you're wise. How many of you guys have accidentally said something that you're like, oh man, probably should not have said that? Or accidentally said something where you're like, oh man, 10 out of 10, regret. You know. This introduces the concept that tongue controls the rest of the body. 
To be able to keep one's tongue in check indicates that one is also able to keep one's whole body in line. James is doubtlessly implying that since speech sins are the most difficult to stop sometimes, we could, if we could stop them, then we surely would be able to stop all the rest. Verse 3. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. James proceeds to give us the illustration that the control of something very large like a horse can be controlled or tamed with something small as the bit that goes into it. Of course, the significance of this illustration is that by the bit going into the horse's mouth, the the rider is able to maneuver the entire horse. How much more can the human tongue and power an entire person. Verse 4. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. James offers a second parallel illustration, this time of a boat. Even more so than the horse, he stresses the size, the great magnitude of this boat, which is controlled by something small, the small rudder on that boat. Pilots retain their power over the ships by, uh, by manipulating that rudder. Wherever they would like to go, left or right, they would change via the rudder. However, if the rudder does not work properly, the ship can veer entirely out of control. In the same way, if the tongue cannot be restrained, the entire person can be uncontrollable. When functioning as it was designed, the tongue, like a rudder, enables those who steer to set the course that they desire. Uh, I'm a yes man. I, I really struggle with that. I, it, it pains me to be a yes man. People will ask me to do things, and I just can't say no. Uh, and this past year at Bible College really tested that. This past year, I was a resident assistant. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a glorified babysitter who looks after college-age kids. Yeah. And most of my time was occupied there, making sure my knuckleheads on my floor weren't doing something dumb, making sure all the guys were tended to, that everyone was taken care of. But I also worked full-time at a bookstore, you know, putting books on shelves and bring it, ringing up orders and all that. But it didn't stop there, because nursing homes, they needed preachers on Mondays. And I said, okay. Wednesday night youth groups needed volunteers, and I said, okay. The cafeteria lady accident, accidentally broke her leg and needed help mopping, and I said, okay. Sometimes I ended up staying up really late at night just trying to catch up on homework, just because my schedule was overloaded. I I took on all these things because I just don't know how to say no. I get myself into a lot of situations because I said I would just simply do it for them. How many of us do that? How many of us also struggle with saying no to people? You know, we end up taking on more responsibility than we really need to. And we end up just doing things just because we said we would. Our speech, our words, they tend to dictate a lot of our actions. Like a horse and the bridle in its mouth, the ship controlled by a small rudder, our words often get us places. We do things because we said we would. And that's not a bad thing, it just shows the power of giving someone our word. Words have the power to bring life. In Genesis, we get an account that God speaks and life is created, or rather cultivated. Something happens when we use our words. Proverbs uh, 18.21 says, Death and life are the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. My most prized possession is a cork board, and that cork board sits in my office. That cork board has notes, letters, encouraging photos, just things that people have written me over the past couple years. And I look at that board, you know, when I'm scared, when I'm sad, when I'm stressed, when I'm freaking out, to remind myself, hey, people are rooting for you. You know, there's, there's something really cool that happens when, when you're encouraged. You know, that cork board is my most prized possession. Please don't steal it. The tongue is a powerful influence for good. My favorite philosopher, uh, Uncle Ben Parker from the Spider-Man series, favorite, he's great. He said, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, the tongue is a powerful influence for good. And in the same way, it's a powerful influence for bad, despite its size. Verse 5. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. James concludes this subsection by making the comparison with the tongue explicit. 
Again, by contrasting the small size of the tongue with the deeds of which it boasts, like the horse guided by a small bit or a boat guided by its small rudder, the little tongue can maneuver the whole person. <clears throat> James's point is that people can either control their tongue or they can let their tongues control them. It is the content of the boast that determines whether it is good or evil. Verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members, that which <clears throat> defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. James explains this illustration. Obviously, the tongue is not literal fire. He's explained the widespread effects that fire can have. The point that James is making is that the tongue can have the same effect like fire. One careless statement, one blind statement can ruin careers, can ruin and destroy lives. It continually corrupts and defiles the person who speaks. It wrongly increases damages to others as fire burns in a forest out of control. The word for hell you here is the word Gehenna. The image was painted by the word to, to, to bring this audience an account of burning sewage, burning flesh, and garbage. That was Gehenna. Gehenna was a valley right outside of Jerusalem, and it was disgusting. The idea presented here is that some of the things that our tongues create is just wicked. It's just awful and wicked. It's complete garbage. Has anyone been on the other end of something awful? Like you've, you've been told something painful, hurtful, discouraging? Have you ever been there where you're paralyzed and you're thinking, why would you say that? That really hurt. Where you're on the other end and you're just stunned. You're in awe. It's like, it's like going to Taco Bell and hearing we don't have any Cinnabon delights. Like, why would you say that? Who do you think you are? That's clearly straight out of Gehenna. Let's pick back up in 7 and 8. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. James is saying that while humans have been able to tame all sorts of wild animals, has, been able to ma has not been able to master the tongue despite all of, its, all of humanity's great achievements in taming. James continues his description of the tongue by relating it to a fatal attraction. Describing the tongue as, a restless, as restless drives home the thought of uncontrollable, or rather, unstable. The image presents an idea that it could lash out at any moment. The image of death bringing poison is dramatic, especially considering that tongues normally are the very thing that we taste life, giving food and drink. Winston Churchill once said, we are masters of the unsaid words, but slaves of those we let slip. When I was younger, there was this kid named Devin. Um, Devin, if you're here, I forgive you. However, this kid Devin was really mean to me. Like, he was just so mean. And I remember it was picture day. I roll up in a similar outfit. I've kind of been wearing the same clothes since I was like in third grade. But, you know, I roll in. I'm feeling pretty good. You know, I'm fly. I have a nice button up. I'm ready to get this picture taken, pass it out to all the honeys in class. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, Devin, Devin was just mean. You see, Devin would pick anything, anything, and he would make fun of me for it. Any, any chance that he got, he would make fun of me for it. When God created me, he said, I'm going to make Kyle very, very advantageous when it comes to the winter. I'm going to give him small eyes so that the glare from the sun reflecting from the snow won't bother him. I'm also going to give him these big cheeks like chipmunks so that when it is time to store the food, he's ready. <laughs> you see, I, I completely believe that, that's how, God, that, that that's, that's how God was saying when he designed me. Sometimes... They, they, see, they tend to contradict themselves. I have small eyes, but really big cheeks. You see, when I smile, my, the muscles in my cheeks, or rather the fat storages that God blessed me with, they retract. And they kind of push up against my eyelids. And in Devin's words, my eyes tend to disappear. So I'm taking my picture. I'm on the stool. And she's like, turn your head. Turn your head. You know, I'm like this. You know, turning my head already. And Devin says, Hey, where'd your eyes go? And I'm like, oh, dang it. He did it. And all the kids in the line, they're laughing at me. They're like, where'd your eyes go, Kyle? Where is it? And Devin, 
he took it a step further. He starts looking around in the classroom that we're in. He's looking around, looking under tables, under desks, through the cabinets, and everyone else joins, and I'm just... trying to hand out pictures to some honey. He's like, why you got to do this to me? <laughs> well, my teacher comes up, and she leans in. She goes, Kyle, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah, I'm still like this, you know, like, I'm just like. <laughs> well, most of us, if not all of us, know that isn't true. Words hurt. Out of words, we have the ability to speak life into others, but the smallest of words can destroy and tear down. Like a fire setting ablaze a forest, it kindles itself. The tongue, despite its size, has the ability to hurt others. The tongue can have powerful influences in both good and bad. These simultaneously uh, good possibilities for good and evil create a unique and inconsistent an inconsistent paradox in God's creation. Verse 9. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. James finally portrays the major problem that makes the tongue so evil. It's duplicity. Blessing the Lord and then cursing others. It reflects the best and the worst traits of human speech. James's disgust is founded on the self-defeating idea of cursing someone made in the image of God. This implies that human beings, despite the fall, return traces of God's image. And so to curse someone, whether or not Christian, is to curse the reflection of the divine. I can get angry. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I can get angry real quick, real fast, especially when I'm driving. When I'm driving, I can get really angry. I have... I, I tend to have road rage, uh, mainly because these past couple of years that I've been going to college in Missouri, God really blessed me with people who know how to use their turn signals. Having been back here, it's a different story. I've been, I've been one to lay and dwell in the realm of the horn of encouragement when someone can't turn, or the headlights of enlightenment. Th- those have been some of my favorite attributes that my beautiful car has. You know, I can get angry real quick, real fast, and the horn of encouragement, and the headlights of enlightenment. You guys can take that as a note. Cite me, though. Um, They tend to be my favorite instruments. But what if I took it a step further? What if, when someone doesn't use their turn signal, or what if someone cuts me off, and I speed up, and I signal, hey, lower your window, and I'm just yelling, and I'm mocking, and I'm screaming? What if I took it that far? What if I was just cursing, yelling, then a couple of weeks, they come to the church, and they're like, oh, blah, 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 I, I'm blah, 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 I'm a sinner, and I cut people off in traffic, and then they see me, and they're like, oh, hi, I'm like, hey, I'm Kyle, I work with the youth. My reputation would be forfeited. The smallest of words can put everything at risk. Whatever the situation, the inconsistency of our speech can be both uncomfortable and contradictory to the beauty of the Imago Dei. You know, th- this is why James says prior to this, in James uh, chapter 1, verse 19, but everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The inconsistency is a unique paradox of our tongue. Verse 10, from the same mouth come both blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not to be this way. James summarizes the contradictory state of affairs and then denounces it. The denunciation declares that the same person should not be capable of both blessing and cursing. James' language strongly rebukes those who speak in the duplicitous manner, urgently insisting that the behavior has no place among Christians. People turn deceitful when, they, when we tend, we turn deceitful when we speak with ill tongues. Like Jesus, James insists that what comes out of people's mouths, that come out of our mouths, illustrate what's in our hearts. This kind of double speak reveals a perversion dwelling inside of us. Jesus says in Matthew 15, the things that proceed out of our mouth come from the heart, and those things defile man. How often have we said something and we question ourselves, where did that come from? Why did I say that? Verse 11, does the fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? To illustrate the abnormality of duplicitous speech, James again turns to an illustration. Here our mouths are compared to springs of water, 
but springs provide either salt or sweet water. They can't produce both. To mix even a little bit of salt would contaminate the water and make it salt water. And it would quick, in the natural world, springs can't just flip a switch and become from sweet to salty and vice versa. So if our words stem from our heart, they should be entirely pure. Not mixing with such evil, such mixing befouls every part of us. Verse 12. Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce fresh? James's point is that no plant can produce the fruit that belongs to a different plant. In the same way, our tongues have been natural conduits of evil ever since the fall, which cannot produce good on its own. It seems better to understand that James, his illustration, it, it, it tends to spring from the impossibility of making salt water into sweet and vice versa. There's also a contrast that comes from Jesus' teaching that those who are good internally will produce good things in their speech, while those who are unredeemed in their hearts may remain poisonous in their mouths. James is looking for consistency in behavior, not perfection. Just as one uh, can depend on a fig tree to grow figs, fresh water springs to spring forth fresh water, the maturing believer should increasingly converse constructively rather than destructively. Everything we say should be helpful, not hurtful. You know, the tongue has the power of life and death. You know, the rotten fruit of, un, of an untamed tongue includes gossiping, belittling, bragging, manipulating, false teaching, exaggerating, complaining, and lying. Spread gossip and people will not trust you. Speak with insults and people will not follow you. Speak with sarcasm and people will not choose you. That one really cuts deep to me. I'm, I'm very sarcastic. And believe me, I, I've for a long time thought my sarcasm was my spiritual gift. <laughs> it's not a spiritual gift. Sarcasm doesn't benefit anyone. It doesn't encourage. Sarcasm doesn't do much for the kingdom. Taming the tongue is not about the reaction of others to your speech, but spreading it's about the spreading of sin from your speech to the rest of your life. Be hateful with your tongue and people will be and you will realize that you're going to be hateful in other aspects of your life. If you're not disciplined and purify your speech, you will dis you will not be disciplined or pure in the rest of your life. In America, we cherish freedom of speech, but with freedom comes responsibility. Responsible citizens in democracy and Christians in any form of society must learn what is helpful and even necessary to say, even when unpleasant, such as in challenging injustice against others and what remains uh, only destructive. Evangelical Christians at times, we tend to have a poor track record when it comes to speaking with love. And almost all people suffer from the tendency to pass on interesting rumors about other people without honestly checking their accuracy, especially in the internet age, which produces a torrent of misinformation, half-truths and personal opinions, all subtly mixed together with genuine facts for just about any Google search anyone wants to execute. In America, we cherish our right to say whatever, whenever, however, we like. But as Christians, that is not true. As Christians, as Christ followers, we cannot say whatever we'd like. We cannot say anything whenever we'd like, however we'd like. Nelson Mandela once said, It is never my custom to use words lightly. If 27 years in prison has done anything to us, it was that the use of silence, of solitude, to make us to understand how precious words are and how real speech is in its impact to the way people live and die. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, I was on my fourth camp week. Uh, hurrah. Uh, it was to Mad Week. Uh, it, it's in Delmarva, and it was awesome. I got to hang out with Chris and Tabby and Mr. Carl Hetzer. You know, and, and one of the nights, we, we did this worship element. This worship element, we had mirrors set up in, in the youth area. And after the set, these students were encouraged to walk up to these mirrors and, and write words that they, that they viewed themselves as, or these words that would define them.
there were only two positive words on those meetings. The, the, the object, the objective of this, of this worship element was to put words that these students define themselves as. There were only two words that were positive on all four of the mirrors. There were four mirrors in total, and only two students could define themselves as beautiful and loved. That's it. The rest, the rest of the mirrors, they were bombarded with words like fat, unworthy, unloved, used goods, damaged, worthless, failure, mistake. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. No matter how long ago, from who, under any circumstance, words stick. Words hurt like rocks. Words hurt. Unfortunately, many, if not all, remember a time where we were told such horrible things. Church, I'm sorry. If you were told something and they didn't reciprocate an I'm sorry or an apology, I'm sorry. If someone has tried to belittle you from the Imago Day, the fact that you were created in the image of God, I'm sorry. Because you are. What if we as a church, as a family, encouraged each other more often? What if we encouraged each other so much that those words no longer haunted any of us? Proverbs 18.21 Words have the ability to bring life or destroy it. Uh, there should be a blank up, up on the screen. It's like a fill-in-the-blank kind of thing. Well, I want you to imagine this. <laughs> Here's a fill-in-the-blank. Next to it is the phrase, is the most loving person I know. What I want you to do with that is put your name there. Put your name in that blank. There it is. Bada bing, bada boom. You know what I'm saying? Put your name in that blank. Blank myself is the most loving person I know. What if that statement became true? What if when people thought about our, our names, about us, people saw that we're the most loving person that they knew? I guarantee you that this place will be so much more than a place that we gather in. We should want people to recognize our love, our encouragement, our desire to bring the kingdom here. As Christians, there's only one choice. You know, we were presented with taming the tongue. Taming the tongue means we either build people up or we destroy other people. As Christians, we only got one, we only got one choice. We only got one of those options to pick from. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another and build up one another. We tame the tongue so that we can encourage and build people up toward the kingdom. Everything we say should be helpful, not hurtful. Thanks for letting me preach this morning. Uh, it's, been, it's been awesome.